Hello and welcome to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast, Season 24, Episode 1, Fort Necessity and the Battle of Jumonville Glen. This episode was written by Doug Nipple. Doug is a high school physics teacher who lives a few miles outside Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Growing up in one of the major areas of early American history, it was only a matter of time before he became obsessively interested in it. In the year 1754, 22-year-old George Washington was on a mission from the Governor of Virginia to enforce the colony's land claim on the area of western Pennsylvania. The French forces had just built Fort Duquesne, modern-day Pittsburgh, as a means to solidify their claim to the land. At this time, both England and France had started to develop the area. France used the waterways and was interested in trade. England was marching overland and more interested in land and territory. The merging of the Monongahela and Allegheny rivers into the Ohio River at Fort Duquesne was to become the centre point of this conflict. Washington was camped in modern Fayette County, Pennsylvania, about 60 miles south of Fort Duquesne, and heard reports from his native allies that there were French in the area. The small French force was commanded by Ensign Jumonville. His diplomatic mission was to tell the English to leave the area. The English, however, did not know that this was a diplomatic mission and believed that they may have hostile intent. In what is now called Jumonville Glen, you can still visit it as a detached portion of Fort Necessity National Park. The French were camped on May 28th, seeking shelter in the rock outcroppings. They numbered maybe 35 regulars and marines. Washington received word of their location from his native allies and took a small force of about 40 of his militia and a dozen or so Mingo Iroquois natives, including their leader, Tanner Carrison, also called the Half-King. Tanner Carrison, the Half-King, was a translator and guide. Various sources say that this title was one of respect and allowed him to negotiate and speak for many tribes. Others say that the title was an invention of the British and doesn't accurately reflect his standing, and he was only a village chief. Regardless, he had a grudge against the French. Supposedly, he was kidnapped by them as a youth, and he even claimed that they ate his father. Evidence suggests he actively worked behind the scenes to force conflict between the English and the French. Washington and Tanner Carrison had moved into position early that morning and attacked the French from commanding positions surrounding their camp. The nature of the French diplomatic mission caused them not to be as worried about being attacked as they should have been, so they were camped in a valley which made them perfect targets from the high ledges surrounding their camp. This was Washington's first combat experience. He ordered the attack, and the French began yelling that they were on a diplomatic mission and for the English to cease fire. Neither Washington or his men understood French. One of Washington's men standing directly next to him was killed by a musket ball, this prompting him later to journal about the thrill of musket balls rushing by one's head. The whistling of the bullets had a most charming sound. There are other accounts that relate that the French spotted the approaching English troops and fired first. The outcome was the same. The English killed a dozen French and wounded twice as many, taking the rest, including Jumonville, as prisoners. Supposedly no one in Washington's group spoke French, or they would have stopped the attack when the French repeatedly and frantically said that they were on a diplomatic mission. Tanner Carrison, however, walked up to the captured Jumonville, and in French said, Thou art not yet dead, my father, and hatcheted Jumonville's head repeatedly, and then, according to accounts, washed his hands in Jumonville's exposed brains. 
The Mingo then began to slaughter the other French prisoners. By the time Washington regained control, probably less than a minute later, the whole trajectory of America and possibly the world had changed. All of the French were dead. This was a bad situation, bad on the level of a diplomatic incident, so bad that it could start a war. The state of affairs between France and England had always been tenuous. The killing in cold blood of a French officer and his men, who were on a diplomatic mission, attacked and then were killed as prisoners under the protection of Washington, could push that state of affairs into crisis. One of the French soldiers managed to escape during the confusion of the fighting. Watching the surrender from a hiding place, he then made his way back to Fort Duquesne. He did not see the massacre. Ensign Jumonville's half-brother, Captain de Villiers, was at Fort Duquesne when the soldier returned. Shortly after Tanner Carrison sent messengers that misinformed the French that the English, not the natives, had massacred all of the French, and that he and his warriors had tried to save them, de Villiers was given permission to strike back. He gathered and then led a large force of French, Canadian and native allies from the Great Lakes region out of Fort Duquesne to seek retribution. Washington knew that the French would be coming for revenge, so he reinforced his position. This became Fort Necessity. The men constructed trenches and earthworks around the fort. The fort itself was just a small circular log post stockade about 50 feet in diameter and more of a fence around a shed that was used as a storehouse. A majority of the militia were stationed outside the fort in the trenches and low earthworks. Some sources say the fort was built more to keep the soldiers from raiding the supplies than as a place to fire their weapons from. Two of the major faults with the fort were that Washington did not clear the timber line back further to provide his men a clear line of fire, and that he built the fort at the bottom of the valley, essentially in a bottom of a bowl with no drainage. Word reached Fort Necessity that Colonel Fry, from the Virginia militia, who was on his way to take command, had fallen from his horse, broken his neck, and died. Washington assumed command of the mission, and Colonel Fry's one hundred men. As the trenches and fortifications were being completed, a force of around one hundred British regulars under Major Mackay arrived to reinforce the militia. Washington called it a charming field for an encounter. Washington was unsure of the size of the French force that was moving towards him, and wanted to make sure his Mingo and Iroquois allies would stay and fight. Originally, he even proposed that the force move on the offensive and attack Fort Duquesne. When Towner Carrison and another Mingo chief, Shingas, met with Washington, they told him they wouldn't be helping directly in the fight. Shingas said he'd assist in some other way. Most of the natives then left for their villages. During this time, Washington was still working on the construction of a road that would allow easy transportation from Virginia into the territory and eventually, he hoped, to the confluence of the rivers at Fort Duquesne. The French force under de Villiers of about 600 soldiers and natives closed in on Fort Necessity, using portions of the road that Washington had been constructing. British soldiers working on the road saw the approaching French and retreated with the news to Washington. Portions of this road still exist today as Route 40, the National Highway. The Battle of the Great Meadow began when the French arrived late in the morning of July the 3rd in the vicinity of the fort and Villiers began to move his troops into the wood line and within musket range. Washington tried to drive them from this position so that his men wouldn't be subjected to cover fire and arranged an assault on the French. He and Mackay lined their forces for a charge on the tree line when de Villiers countered by sending his own men across the meadow to attack Washington's troops. The regulars under Mackay were organised and stood firm, firing volley shot and slowing the French assault. The militia, however, broke and retreated to their trenches and the fort. Without the support of the militia, the regulars were outnumbered and moved to cover as well. The French surrounded the fort in a defensive position, in the tree line 
with a torrential rain falling. It had already been raining since the day before, and Washington's men in the open trenches in the middle of the field had all their powder drenched and were waist-deep in their flooded defensive positions. The French and Indian allies in the tree-line surrounding the fort had some shelter under the trees and were able to keep their powder dry and continue firing into the fort. British casualties started to mount. They couldn't fire back, and just as things looked like they might have to surrender, Washington saw the French signalling for a parley, a negotiation. Why a negotiation? The French had them surrounded, and the English were losing men quickly. Many sources claim that the French powder was also becoming soaked, or running low, and they did not know that the English were in such a bad way, so they wanted to end the conflict before, maybe, events turned on them. Other sources say that it turned out that Chief Shingas's promise of help came in an unexpected way. The native scouts had told the French all day that they were hearing British drums, meaning a relief force was on its way. There was no relief force, but the French believed the lie, and it forced a negotiation. The main parties in the parley met in the small storehouse at the centre of the fort during the night. The surrender agreement, a soggy document written in French, was presented to Washington. His official translator had been wounded, so he had the document translated for him by candlelight in the leaky shed by an adjunct officer whose French was lacking. The terms seemed favourable. Washington and his troops were able to leave the fort with their weapons and colours, promising not to return. The translator had missed the part about Washington admitting to assassinating Ensign Jumanville in cold blood. Washington signed the document, and both sides retired for the night under a ceasefire. On July the 4th, the French destroyed the fort after the British march-off. The French had a damning document. Washington, a British officer, had signed a paper admitting to murdering a French officer. His name would become famous, but not for the reasons he wanted. The ambitious young George Washington had inadvertently fired some of the opening shots at the start of what would become a global conflict, what would become known as the Seven Years' War. Washington would write shortly after that he would always remember that date. July the 4th, with regret. More English troops were sent to America after word of the loss at Great Meadows was reported in Parliament. The surrendered document was used by the French to justify their troop build-up in the Americas and discredit English claims to that area. The very next year, General Edward Braddock and a much larger army of English regulars, with Washington along as an aide to Braddock, marched along the same road towards Fort Duquesne. Washington had survived the surrender, politically, and was actually thanked for his service by the Virginia legislature. He would also survive the coming massacre of Braddock's army by a smaller French and native force firing from cover just a few miles from their destination. The English resolve was now set, though, as more men and missions were sent into the frontier to dislodge the French and expand the empire. If you would like to write an episode for us, just as Doug has done for this one, then drop us a line, info at thehistorynetwork.org. We'd love to hear from you. We'll give you a hand in writing the script if you'd like a hand with doing that as well. So don't hold back. If you've got an idea, then drop us a line and let's get that going. Also, do like and follow us on Facebook. Just search for The History Network on there. You can also check out all of our other podcasts, including Angus's own podcast about World War II, by going to the website, thehistorynetwork.org. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the thehistorynetwork.org podcast, written by Doug Nipple, read by Nick Barker.